morning. Happy first Sunday. First Sunday of uh, April. Uh, glad to see you. Everybody looking good. Uh, we're here to praise the Lord today. So I'll turn it over to our uh, choir right now. Thank you. Good morning, my brothers and my sisters. Good morning. God is good. Amen. 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 Just reminded this morning when I was reading my daily bread how I was telling Sister Pam how it said, um, um, name, um, can, you, can you name five things that you're thankful for in a week? It's like, I can name five things I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for that God raised me up this morning, and he raised me up in my right mind. I'm thankful for you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, thankful for my church family, just grateful and thankful that, that God is with us, that he's carried us. I don't know about you, but I need him each and every day, every day. I need him every hour, amen? Amen. amen. And, and the song we're singing this morning is, how great is our God. Amen. Amen. I also thought about the times where I worried about my son being away from me for four years. And he's about to graduate in June. How God carried him for four years while his mama was some night sleepless because she was wondering, you know, as far as his protection. But God has carried him. He's carried Miles. He's also carried Valerie. And we just praise God for those of our young people who will be graduating soon. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good. Can we stand, please? And, and we just want to sing how great is our God. Amen? And remember just to thank him each and every day. That's all right. You can put your hands together. However the Lord leads you today. We want to worship you today, Lord. No distractions. Amen. How great. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, the splendor of a king, the splendor of
Hey, my church family and visiting friends. My name is Nelvia Davis. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Earl C. Stuckey Sr., and the Progressive Missionary Baptist Church family, we welcome all visitors to our morning worship service. We are called the Friendly Church on the Avenue. Our purpose here at Progressive is to grow in our faith and knowledge of God so that we are equipped to lead individuals to salvation and train them to follow Christ and serve in God's ministry. We are glad you chose to worship with us today. Thank you for coming, and please come again. Amen. What a great welcome. Amen. Amen. If we could stand one more time. I sing praises to your name. Amen. Amen. Why? Because you are great. You are greatly to be praised. We've sung how great he is. So now, Lord, we're singing praises to you. Amen. sing praises to your
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My name is Brother Edward Cooper, and I'm blessed to be able to read today's scripture. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of 2 Timothy, verses 1 through 18. I will read it in its entirety, and I would ask that you all read verse 18 with me. Thank you. 1 Timothy, verse chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. It reads as thus, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, yeah. and I'm persuaded yeah. that he is able to keep what I have committed to him yeah. until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Pelagius and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously, and found me, verse 18, all together. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many more he ministered to me at Ephesus. And the Lord had a blessing to the readers, here and the students of his word. Let's, you may be seated. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, Lord, we come into your house today, Lord. We come with praise on our lips and thanksgiving in our heart, Lord. We come to praise and worship you, Lord, for you are worthy of all praise and worship. You are omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for all of your benefits. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We gather today, Lord, as we're going to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the taking of our communion today. But we are here, Lord, to lift you up today, Lord, to thank you for carrying us through this past week, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for the good times. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for the hard times that we learned from those two, Lord, because you, you were not putting them more on us than we can stand, Lord. And, 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 and when you do chastise us, Lord, it's for our benefit. We say thank you for the chastisement, Lord. 
And now, Father, we ask that you bless this service that we have today, Lord. Let it be a sweet-smelling nostril sweet smell and savor in your nostrils today, Lord. Bless us, Lord. Bless the man of God who brings the word today, Lord. We actually look in on those who are sick and shut in, those who weren't to be with us today but couldn't for whatever reasons, Lord. Let us just keep them in our hearts, Lord. And now we just ask that you dismiss us from this day but not from your presence, Lord. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we just pray, Lord. Amen. Pastor Gilmore, will you come sit with me and my wife? Pastor Gilmore is no stranger to this church. Yeah.
Y'all ain't no spectators. You are fellow worshipers. Say it with me now. I am a fellow worshiper. And we're going to worship the master. Give him the glory that's due his name. Now, we're getting ready to sing together the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. Don't tell me you don't know it. If you remember PBC, I know. All right. Let's stand to our feet and let's worship him. And thank him for the blood that he shed for us on Calvary's cross. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Never will lose its power. Not gonna Thank lose his you, power. Jesus. His microphone has lost his power. <laughs> but he ain't gonna lose his power. <laughs> Two thousand years from today, yes. still working. Yes. Still saving people. Yes. Still strengthening people. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the choir for lifting us up in song this morning. Especially as we look at this passage in, in Timothy and as we continue for this road ahead. We have to be ready for the road ahead. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, I pray that the words that come from my mouth are solely what is reflected in Scripture. May I say nothing of my own opinion. May I have emptied myself so that way I can be filled with your word. And only state what is in your word with the power and conviction with which you have given it to us. I thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our guiding light and teacher. May he convict where it needs to be convicted. And may he strengthen and uphold and uplift in all areas of our life. So that we might live according to your word as we see in scripture. We ask that you'll just be with us for this time. Prepare my heart as well as the hearts and minds of those who may be listening to hear your word and to hear you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever been ashamed? You ever been afraid? What happens when you're afraid and when you're ashamed? What usually happens to your actions? Are you just as vigorous and you're able to step out onto the court or step into the arena or are you able to perform at your best? Or do you leave your house shoes on and stay home? You send a proxy. You stay from a distance. You don't push forward into the road ahead. We see here in Timothy in this letter, as, as Paul is rolling out this letter to Timothy, we see that Paul is now getting Timothy ready for the road ahead. This isn't 1 Timothy anymore. It's not written at the same time. He didn't write two letters and they just broke them up in two times. He sat down at a different time to coin another letter to his mentor, to his mentee that he had in Timothy. See, he wasn't setting the stage for somebody who was on his way to take over a church anymore. He didn't have to tell them how to set up an administration. He's not interested in trying to set up deacons and elders and what needs to be happening. You, you know how to take care of widows. You know how to take care of individuals in the church that may be there. You may want to be mindful about the rich, because if there's anybody that's going to wreck your church, it's the rich. You don't want high-minded folk running around thinking too much about themselves. You want to make sure we keep them where they need to be and make sure they're rich in good works. He's not worried about establishing an administration anymore. Now we see Paul at the end of his life. The rope is just about over. He knows that, hey, he's being poured out, and this journey is going to go on without him. So he sits down to write to his mentee in this same vein. It resonates with me and with many of you who've had the opportunity of watching somebody pass on in this life, slowly. Maybe it was a grandmother, or a mother, or a father, or an uncle. Somebody who leaned into you, and who at that very moment, at that very time, was able to communicate to you, hey, you know what? You can keep on going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's with that same tone and that same teariness that Paul sits down to coin this same letter. It's not a happy tone in terms of what's going on in his life. It's a happy tone because he's like, hey, I need you to keep on pushing. Amen. Well, what can wreck those two things? We'll look at them expressly this morning in terms of how they can be wrecked. And then we'll look at what we need to do in terms of the road ahead. Two things that can quickly wreck us from being on this path is being ashamed 
and being afraid. And Paul wanted to make sure that he addressed Timothy with both of those areas. He says to him, hey, look, don't be ashamed. Don't quit. Here's what you need to do. You need to rekindle this gift that you've got in front of you. And you need to stay attached to the source that's giving you your strength. Let's see if we can't follow this in the text. And as always, I'm always open for corrections afterwards, being able to have conversations. I realize that so a lot of times this isn't an open dialogue. This is just people dropping stuff on you, and you have to figure out and sort those pieces out. But sermons are living because they come from a text, and they should hopefully inspire those who love Christ to continue on in the work of Christ. Amen. And it's an open dialogue where we can continue to discuss and, 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 and go over God's word as well. Because that's the true benefit of this fellowship, is being in the same space as individuals who love the body of Christ. Yeah. And we should remove all distractions from that particular case. Well, as we find ourselves in the text, what's the first thing that Paul says to him that we want to be mindful of? He's like, hey, look, you jump with me in 2 Timothy chapter 6. He says, uh, beginning at verse 4 and verse 5, he's like, hey, longing to see you as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. And I'm not sure if the tears that he has for Timothy are tears where he can, he's been close enough to Timothy where he's talking about the joyful times. But I think he's talking about the tears of pain. And if you've ever done anything for Christ, you know there's pain involved. There are a lot of people who say they're going to stand with you. But when it's time to actually do the work and you're handing out shovels, they're not there. <laughs> that there's times when you show up. And as folks who wrote their name down on the list that was like, yeah, I'm with you, they're not there. There are times when you realize the people that you thought were going to be with you, and they're talking, and it's about you. It's not with you. But you have to understand those tears, and Paul is getting him ready for the road ahead. Like, I remember those tears. I remember the angst that you have. And they fill me with joy because it lets me know you're in the struggle. And this endeavor of being in the church is part of the struggle. For Paul, it was everything. He realized his life work that God had given him this mission to do, that he was specifically placed here to take God's word and give it to Gentiles, was coming to an end. So he passes these things along to Timothy while saying, hey, look, I remember what it was. I remember seeing your tears along this way. Not only do I, am I mindful of your tears, I know where they came from. I came from a sincere faith. It was genuine. There was nothing hypocritical about your faith. There was a genuine faith that you had that was not only genetically in you, it was genetically, I saw it in your grandmother and I saw it in your mother. I have seen it. This, this thing that you have, almost like a trait, almost like your height, your skin color. Paul was telling him this trait, this sincere faith didn't originate with you. It started a couple generations ago. You come from good stock. <laughs> and you, you come from some folk who know their way around the cross. They put their faith in Jesus Christ. And by faith, that means every day, that's the day-to-day -day work that nobody else can see. That's when you turn on the lights in the gym and nobody else is there. That's when you huddled up at the table with your scriptures and nobody else is around you. The sincere faith to keep plugging in, to keep doing the heavy lifting every day, knowing that one day it's going to pay off, but at present you see absolutely no fruit from what is going on. That is a sincere faith, and that was recognizable both in his mother and his grandmother, and Paul is telling him it is also in you. Keep the faith. Don't give up. No matter what the outcomes may look like, there is a genetic trait which is in the inner man which can't be fed by diets or money or food that you must keep the faith, and that faith is what is going to keep you pressing on. At the time this letter was written, it was probably close to persecution. That means you wasn't coming to church and sitting in no warm building trying to figure out what you was going to do for lunch afterwards. You were coming to church under threat of death. Like, oh, you name the name of Christ, I might not be succeeded. I, I might not live from here. I might forfeit my house that I live in because I've named the name of Christ. I might forfeit my job. I might forfeit my status, give up my family. This is the type of faith where they had that he was working under here. Is that similar to our faith? 
No, nah, we're more worried about what we're going to get for Ross for Easter Sunday, right? <laughs> what are our concerns? Oh, don't worry. We get to see him at the business meeting. We can write them all down and list out all the concerns that we have. But that doesn't measure up to a sincere faith. And hopefully we can address these issues because we're a church body, right? And we've got to deal with certain things. But this is a sincere faith. He's not worried about paint colors and, and, and sanctuary toil. He's worried about how do we keep this thing, which is the love of God, going for another generation. And that trait was in his grandmother, in his mother, and is also in him. Paul knew he had to get him ready for the road ahead. And in order to get him ready for the road ahead, he reminded him where he came from. What are some things that he wanted to make sure that he guarded him against? One thing he definitely wanted to guard him against, he was like, if you skip down to verse 6, he says, hey, look, for this reason, or excuse me, verse 7, for God, when he was passing out gifts, he didn't give us a spirit of fear. That was not one of the things that we had. This is not a war for the faint at heart. This takes energy. Do you realize that the riches of the church are the people? It has nothing to do with what we have in the bank. The people who love the God that we serve, may all this burn down. We will meet ourselves in a field somewhere so that we can fellowship around God's word. This ain't for the faint at heart. What are you supposed to do with your enemies? I didn't hear it. What are you, what are you supposed to do with your enemies? <laughs> okay. Love them. So that means that when you put an extra piece of chicken in the pot, what are you supposed to do with it for your enemy? If he's hungry, right? What about the folks who ain't lovable? <laughs> you got to love them anyway, right? What did Jesus do for Peter? He met him on the beach and had a fish fry, right? After having denied the faith. You dealing with people, and I don't know if there is a messier animal on the planet than people. It's global warming. We messing up the whole planet, heating up all the oxygen in this place. That's how much hot air we got. Just so we can have indoor plumbing, watch TV when we want to, and, and, and wear and drive all the cars we want to drive. We a messy group of folks to live with, right? But the God we serve said we should not be afraid. So what happens when they talk bad about you? And they are. Pray for them. <laughs> That's all you can do. We, we, we can't let fear paralyze you. I remember one of the things that really separated, I, I was never going to play professional basketball at any, any point in time in my career. Maybe college if I would felt like it. I didn't. I went the wrong road, and I just decided I was going to do something else with my life. But one of the things that separated my career, I clearly remember. I had good enough skill set. But one of the things that changed when I got to ninth grade, which wasn't there in seventh grade, is I started to listen to the crowd. And then you, you, you don't play with the same fluidity. You're not trying to cross anybody over, and you're not playing defense because you're scared. You can't play to your full ability when you're scared. You can't go out and try and perform at your best when you're scared. Playing scared only means that you are going to hurt your teammates at best, and you're probably going to hurt yourself and your teammates at worst because you're not giving your full ability to the task at hand. Why are we not giving our best performance for God? Now, I'm not talking about Sunday mornings. I know it takes a lot for us to get up and get dressed and come here, but on Tuesday, why are we not looking for those who we know we don't have a good relationship with and reaching across the aisle to say, how are you doing? Am I still stepping over somebody that I know is hurting? We don't have this sort of fear that we need to be able to play scared. 
Let us play to our full ability. Amen. Fear is one of the things that will definitely wreck us. What was one of the other things that will wreck us this morning? If we skip down to verse 15, we're not going in order of terms of verses. Hopefully this makes sense um, when we get through. But if we skip down to verse 15, the other thing that's going to wreck us is this feeling of being left alone. You're aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me. Paul reminds Timothy, like, hey, look, the folks who was with us on this journey, Remember we started with the team bus and it was full? Yeah. They all gone. <laughs> Remember the people who we helped fed and, and prayed for and got all them folks? They're all gone. They've deserted the faith. He knew that, hey, you're going on on this road and some folks that you were going to be with you that started this journey with you, some of them folks you appointed as elders and deacons ain't going to be there. <laughs> I got to get you ready for the road ahead. And the two dangers that we see in the text that he really wants to guard against is one, you need to be afraid. Don't, don't have the spirit of fear. Two, you don't want to have this spirit of being deserted. And thirdly, you don't want to have this spirit of being ashamed. When you're ashamed, you feel like you've lost your status. You don't walk with the same step. You don't have the same conviction when you move. There's this painful feeling that you can't get rid of. And we see where he guards against him. He's like, hey, just make sure that you are not ashamed. Amen. We see these three things, and they kind of play in each one of our lives in various different spaces, in terms of fear, in terms of being ashamed, and in terms of feeling alone. Make sure that these narratives, we, when they come from, they know they, they come from Satan. And he's only got one mission, and that is to divide and conquer. So if the words of our mouth are not building unity, then I, it is okay if we guard the words that come from our mouth. I believe he actually says that in the text. <laughs> Remember the sound words, right? So how do we get out of this chasm? I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to play in fear. I don't want to be ashamed. I've got nothing to be ashamed of. And how do I know that I'm not deserted? How do we tackle these three things? Well, now we jump right on into the text. And we say to ourselves, how do we deal with this? And Paul tells him the first thing he has to do is that in verse 6, for this reason, let me remind you of one thing, young man. Let me remind you that you need to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you. But he's saying to him literally is, hey, you need to take this gift that you have and fan it into a flame. You know, you can't cook chicken with a pilot light. You can't. <laughs> you can put all the coals you want to under that barbecue pit. Until you light those things, <laughs> you ain't going to get nothing out of it. He is saying to him, hey, look, in continuous fashion, without interrupting what you have going on in your life, you need to always be re relighting the pilot light and so that way you can fan what I gave you into a flame. It has to be a flame big enough to warm up your life. It has to be a flame big enough to warm up your congregation. It's got to be a flame big enough to warm up this entire community because the faith that we have placed in Jesus Christ is resting in you. It has been entrusted in you. And of any of the things that the people of this world or the people that are around you in your community are going to try and do, they're going to try and put out your flame. The struggles in life are real. PG&E shows up every month. Mortgage shows up every month. Right? Without hesitation. Even when you pay it off. Property taxes. You must render unto Caesar. In this life, you must work. You are going to have toils. You're going to have snares. You are going to struggle. And on top of this, we see we find ourselves in the text where it's like, hey, you're going to suffer for Christ. How do we handle that? You need to make sure you rekindle your flame. 
take time apart. There is a gift that God has placed in each and every last one of us. And it is our responsibility to rekindle that flame. Those who name the name of Christ, you've been given the spirit of a cheerleader no matter what. Baseline, you can at least root for somebody else. If you don't have, you don't figure out what you know you're supposed to be doing for yourself. You can at least grab some pom-poms and say, hey, what's going on over there? Cool. Let me cheer on what's going on over there. Because we ought to be given a spirit of reconciliation and encouragement because the God we serve has conquered death. And since he has conquered death, all of the other problems are very small and minute. So since I've got grand victory, I can deal with the small subtleties of life. I can deal with all of the things because my hope is beyond all of my problems. My problems only last till Tuesday. My hope's got till Sunday, right? I got way more hope than I have any of the problems that I will incur in this life. Do I, does that mean that I don't have shortcomings? Absolutely not. I need to spend the majority of my time looking in the mirror as opposed to looking in the window to see what you have going on. My focus is on how do I improve my life and grow in the grace and God that God has given to me so I can see where I'm coming up short in terms of the gift that he has given to me. It is my job to make sure that I'm doing that and fanning that flame as much as I can. And then I can recognize the flames in others and maybe send a little <laughs> your way, right? Let me blow on you so you can blow it into a flame. You, you know you've been to a campfire before, right? Like if you want to build a fire, you add wood to it. If you don't, you throw water on it. Like, uh, we ought to be encouraging each other at the work that we've got to do because we're the only group who's going to do it for each other, right? We're in the body of Christ. Where are we going to get support from? Is Bank of America going to heap support for the church? It's not their job to, right? Is our government going to heap support for it? No, that's not the government's job to do. It is our job because we are on a mission of God. We have been saved from so great a death that we should see this whole new lease on life as an opportunity to do good. We find ourselves here staring at this, and he's like, hey, Tim, rekindle this. And through Timothy, who kept this letter probably close to his heart, to progressive some 2,000 years later, rekindle this. That's what you go to Bible study for. It's not to get head knowledge. It's not to have become some theologian so you can, you know, play Bible wordsmith with folk. No, it's so that you can love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness. That's how you know you spent time around God, when somebody can express those things in their lives. It's not a measure of bank accounts or intelligence or ability or, or wisdom. It's the simple things of the fruit of the Spirit. And instead of worrying about what we're reaping, let's worry about what we're planting. Make sure we put our seeds in the ground to show that we can we are continuously about trying to grow and improve. And we are looking for ways that we can support and grow and improve others. We need to make sure that we rekindle our gift. How else do we get out of this quagmire of fear, feeling deserted, and being ashamed? Second thing is we need to know our source. Where does this come from? In verse 7, he tells us, hey. God wasn't passing out the spirit of, of fear, but he was passing out this. He was passing out power, he was passing out love, and he was passing out, in my Bible it says discipline, right? He was passing those three things out. Now, I was listening to a theologian this morning, uh, one of my favorite ones, I got plenty, um, uh, which was Terrence Sims, and Terrence was um, elaborating on this very same passage of scripture, and he consolidated into these three things. He said there was courage, you need compassion, and you need control. Now, it's great. I was like, I did a whole bunch of work, and he came up with that one and dropped it on this morning. I was like, I should have saved my time and just called him, and he could have helped me with that particular juncture. But that's exactly the things that, we, that he outlines here. The first thing he says, hey, he was passing out a spirit of power. Now, some of us are fortunate enough to be able to own these luxurious cars, right? And some cars, especially trucks, they have what's known as a towing capacity. You, you do know what a towing capacity is, right? Yeah, that means you can't hook a motorcycle or a trailer up to everything, right? They, the, the Toyota RAV4 may not pull a, 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 a trailer home. It's just not going to do it. It doesn't have the capacity to do it. It's not that it's not a car. It's not that it doesn't have an engine. It just don't have the strength. Paul reminds Timothy, guess what? What you hooked up to, you got the strength. May they persecute the church and lay all everybody asunder. You got the strength to keep this going. 
How do you deal with issues and problems in life? You have the strength to keep this going. This is what God was passing out. He was passing out the strength to endure. Not to where when we see problems, we, we give up and we quake and we, we try and figure out and start to become, you know, resentful and hurtful. He gave us the spirit, the, the spirit of power to know that, you know what, if you keep on hauling, you will get to where you need to get to. You have everything that you need to do what is necessary. This church don't need external stuff to come in and make the magic happen. We got enough. <laughs> We have to be able to use it, right? This country doesn't need external stuff. You got enough. <laughs> You've got to be able to use it. There's enough strength and power, and you want to stay tied into that strength and that power to deal with the hardships of life. Is life hard? It is. Is life fun? It is fun. Life is very fun. The challenge is you just can't let it break you. <laughs> Because when it breaks you, you, you become hurt. And you don't really know you're hurting until you look at all the solutions that you've given and realize, like, huh, well, maybe I didn't build anybody up with that. <laughs> I want other people to hurt like me. And it's like, no, that's not the thing that we need to be a part of, right? We got the power to keep pushing. So no matter what you dump on my desk, I'm always looking for a solution. Or I'm going to help you look for a solution. I'm going to help you carry it back with you again. Because it's not my problem, right? We got power to deal with everything that we have. We know that God ain't going to give us anything we can't handle. So we know that he has given us the strength and the power to be able to do with everything that we need. Paul had to remind Timothy he's got power. He needs to have that, that, that courage behind him that says, yeah, you can step out there. When everybody says, this is what we're doing, it's like, uh, let me get back to the text. And this is what God said. So that means like 12 angry men, one person starts off on the other side of the room and then has to convince the other ones. If sometimes you have to stand in God's word and this is it, yeah. Timothy, you know that you have the power to be able to do that in the world in which you live. Yeah. Paul wanted to make sure that he understood that and that was communicated to him that he has power. He wanted to make sure also not with this power, he doesn't have this, this iron fist that he rules with, but he should do it with love. You need to make sure that you are in comfort and that you are guidance and think about others. That is where you think about somebody else more than yourself. Amen. This is when you look at all of your requests and you say, okay, at the end of these, is it I want or is it how can I help? But he wants to make sure that he knew that God was passing out that spirit as well. And he also wants to make sure he knew that he had, hey, we pass out this spirit of discipline. You got to be able to run your race within your lane. You can't run nobody else's race. And you can't tell nobody about the race that they got to run. You need to run your race effectively. Yeah. It is the discipline that is going to make you better. You do know that a barbecue pit and you can burn down the city with the exact same thing. It's the same element. It's the same fire. The same rekindling. And I think he put it there on purpose just to let you know. You take fire and you don't have any way of bounding it or controlling it. It is of no use to you. It is also becomes dangerous. Yeah. It's true. Make sure we play under control. Amen. How do we counteract the spirit of fear, the spirit of deserting, the spirit of being ashamed? You rekindle your gift and you make sure that you play. You have the power to do it. You should do it with love and concern for others, and you should do it under control. I'll leave you this morning with this last one as Paul left us in the text. Well, okay, I got two things, and I'll do them quickly because I know I can see us. We're fading fast. That's the great thing about being up here and looking at the audience. You can see and you can pay attention, and you look around, and you always know your room. You have to study your audience. I mean, why, why not? You, you, I mean, you, you talk to the woman at the well about water. You don't talk to her about theology, right? <laughs> but there are two things, and I, I must, must say this in, in regards to on my way being to, to my seat, is that the first thing is that we want to know who we are doing this for, and that's in verse 10. May we never lose sight of the fact that Paul says, hey, look, we, we serve Jesus Christ who took the time, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It is always imperative to me that the blood that keeps working, that they keep singing about, what we keep in showing up on Sunday mornings for is the blood that abolished death. 
It stood there as nothing. Everybody from then till now, from the beginning of time, Adam, till Christ has suffered until death. They can figure out how to land on the moon and how to land that rocket in the Pacific Ocean on a, on a garbage can right now. All of them, everybody has to deal with death. You can't escape it. You can avoid, you can avoid taxes. We've seen that. <laughs> it ain't taxes. You just need a better tax man if you want to avoid taxes. In the American system of government, you can avoid taxes no matter how you get around it. But death is undefeated. <laughs> the only person and one would be Christ. <laughs> he is the only one that stands on the other side of life and with the, the ability to be able to say that death is in the rearview mirror. And I'm standing in the same line that he's in. That's the only only reason why I get this glory and this joy is not as if I'm standing off in this line by myself. At the head of this line is Jesus Christ. And all those who have come behind him, and I stand behind him in this line with my head up high waiting instructions for how I might be useful in this generation. Along with that, the second thing is, how do we become useful in this generation? Well, it is amazing in this text who shows up this character that is erected from eternity and his name is Onesiphorus. And Onesiphorus didn't say he bred no sermons. Didn't say he ever, he ever climbed and, and fed a million people. It didn't say he did a whole bunch of stuff. But down in verse 16 and contrasting with all the individuals, he says, hey, remember this guy and how he refreshed me. I pray that throughout all of my existence, I swear I, I, I would leverage everything that I have to make sure that I know that whoever I came in contact with, I just helped. I don't need no pulpit. I don't need, I like, when I stand before God, that's all I want to say is like, hey, you know what? I tried my best to help people. <laughs> that's it. I, that's the only testimony I hope I will ever give to anybody within the body of Christ is that, hey, when somebody was struggling, they knew they could come to you and get a hand. They knew that they could come to you and count on you to be a refresher. Because you never know what stage of life you meet anybody at. We only have each other for a very short season. And people will always remember the time you took out your hand and was like, here, do you need this? I always often remember the people who have helped me. And I don't always get to say thank you. But I remember those people who have helped me along the way. And Paul leaves Timothy with this amazing example of somebody who refreshed him. Remember when I was in Rome in verse 17, he came and found me eagerly, looking for me, trying to find me. And you know what he did to me at Ephesus. How do you get prepared for the road ahead? Find a way to help. Rekindle that gift that's inside of you. Know that the power that we have is of God. And we have the strength to be able to do what we need to get done. Know that we need to do it in a way that is loving and showing concern for everybody else around us. And know that we need to do it in control. Praise God the line we stand in at the front of the line is somebody who's abolished death. And may we find our example in Paul, in Timothy, and in Onesiphorus to make sure that we do our best to help others get ready for the road ahead. Amen. Amen. May we not proceed with caution. May we not proceed with fear. May we not proceed with ambition, selfish ambition. May we not proceed with being ashamed. There's a fire inside of us. Every last one of us. And it's our personal responsibility to do something with that fire. May we fan it into a flame. And may we share that with as many people as we come in contact with. So there may be some here who do not know the Savior that we serve. And at this time, we extend, we always extend an invitation. It is not over when the song is done. If on Tuesday you feel like, you know what, I might want to go back up there, please reach out. Somebody in the office will get back to you shortly. Get to know the God that we serve. He has abolished death. 
And we serve him because he loved us and cared for us enough to give his life for ourselves. We encourage you to come and follow him because he will take care of you as he has taken care of all of humanity to the present. So we extend this opportunity, this opportunity now for those of you who may be considering press in with Jesus Christ. Michelle Walker and her mother, Kathleen, thank you for your prayers. Amen. Kathleen is now home, recovering from a pneumonia. Amen. Please pray for Bernice Wright. She is scheduled for a surgical procedure to remove a cancerous growth Monday, tomorrow, April 8th. Please pray for Elder Cooper's sister-in-law, Cozy Jerome and Tony Booker. They are both having health issues. Continue to pray for those who are sick and homebound, and for those who have lost loved ones. Now we will have our announcement. Are you grieving the loss of a loved one? Join us at Grief Share, which is a weekly grief support group on Zoom. We're meeting on Tuesday evening from 6.30 until 8.00. The women's ministry has started five small groups involving 16 women, reading one chapter of scripture daily and discussing weekly. This is a six-week commitment. God has blessed the participants as they are enjoying increasing their time of reading the Bible with other women and sharing their observations. Our summer book club reading will be 50 women every Christian should know. Please sign up as we prepare to order the books if you're interested in participating. 
You may contact Roz Simpson, Shirley Reynolds, LaVon Kilgore, or Charles Etta McCrory. Or text your desire to participate. Linda Thomas, our BCA coordinator, wants to remind you that it is checkup time. It has been six months since our breast cancer awareness fair, and she wants to encourage everyone to get their breast cancer screening done for 2024. Do not mm -hmm. delay. Early detection saves lives. Mm -hmm. Linda is also will be participating in a cancer walk on Saturday, May 18th at Heather Farm Park in Walnut Creek. The walk is being sponsored by Epic Care Chemo and Radiation Clinic. Linda and her oncologist, Dr. Alley, who has who was our BCA guest speaker in 2019, would love to see some of the ch progressive Baptist church family members who can join the, her team. The registration cost is $35 per walker. This includes a t-shirt. If interested, Contact Linda Thomas. This concludes our announcement. Now we are in the hands of Pastor Stuckey for our communion service. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll be reading from the scriptures from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. Uh, raise your hand if you didn't get any communion. We're bringing it around now. Okay, everyone got it? Okay, let's read uh, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 30. Robert. Okay, and it reads, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he had betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come, till he come. Therefore, whoever eats this, eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood, body of, and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drink judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 30, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Let us uh, prepare our hearts for prayer. Uh, Father God, we come to you again, Lord, thanking you for your grace and mercy, and thank you for all the things that you do in our lives, Lord. And Lord, we thank you, most definitely thank you, for giving us the opportunity to sit at this, at this table to sup with you, Lord. Lord, we just ask your blessings over the wafer that we're about to receive that is uh, broken for your body and the grape juice uh, which represents your blood. Lord, we just ask you to continue to pray for, uh, for all of us, Lord. Continue to be with us throughout this week, Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we all say, Amen. Okay, first of all, the Lord Jesus uh, gave the bread to his disciples. And he said, take this and, and eat it. Now, when we do this, we do it because First of all, Christ commands us to do it. And when we do it, we obey what Christ has commanded. I don't know about you, but I look forward to this time to meet with God's people when we together obey this command. But I don't stop at being thankful for this time. I look forward to that day at the marriage supper of the Lamb when we will in the presence of our Savior uh, eat again of this bread and drink from the cup. And I personally make it a point to confess my sins I'm not one of those who, who go around bragging about I do not sin. I, I sin either by omission or commission or by word, deed, or thought. And so what I do is what you should do also. And praise God, we are able to do it together. First of all, Lord Jesus gave the bread to his disciples. And he said, take this and eat it. For this is my body, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. And I say to you, I will not eat any more of this bread until that day I eat it together with you in the kingdom of God. Let us all do it together. Let's eat the bread together. Then after he gave them the bread to eat, he gave them the fruit of the vine and said, take this and drink all of it. This is my blood, the 
that you shed for many for the remission of sins. And I say to you, I will not drink any more from the fruit of this vine until that day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us all drink together. Amen. After they had finished with the eating of the bread and the drinking from the cup, the Bible says when they had sung a hymn, it did say him, not her. <laughs> When they had sung a hymn, not H-I-M, <laughs> but a hymn. I love the hymns. I cannot get ready for some of this new stuff. I love the hymns. Amen. And we got it from the Lord Jesus. They sung a hymn before they went out into the Mount of Olives. Here at Progressive, we say we enter to worship and we leave to serve. And the title of our song is Next Time We Meet. As all of the cups been picked up. Because I don't want I, want, I don't want us walking when we're getting ready to sing. Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> just wait, just wait. Now, I've told you this before, I can't sing, but I got it in me. <laughs> it just doesn't come out the way it ought to. But I got it in me. Amen. We all finished up upstairs. Okay. Let's all stand. <clears throat> the title of our song is I Can't Hear You. Next time we meet. Amen. All right. You ready? Next time we meet, there'll be no more tears. Next time we share the bread and the wine. Maybe tomorrow or maybe next year. We will be one next time. Some will have most will have high, all will have felt the touch of pain. Wherever we go, there's one thing we know, love conquers everything. Tomorrow or maybe next year, we will be one next time. 
Tomorrow. 